Welcome to review lecture number 13, part of my online review course of undergraduate probability and statistics. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this class, and this is a lecture on inferences about a mean. We've actually already done some inferences about a mean in the last couple of lectures, but uh, today we'll review those applications and uh, show a couple more. Remember that one of the main goals and one of the main uh, tasks of statistics is to make inferences about a population based on data from a sample. For example, when I run an experiment, my goal is not to understand the experiment. My goal is to use the results of the experiment to understand something fundamental about the material or process or device that I'm testing. Uh, nobody really cares about my experiment per se, but they may care about the device or the process or, or something more general. And that's the same thing as making inferences from the sample, the very limited amount of experimental data that I collect, to tell me something about the population, the, um, the generalized uh, understanding of how this process works or how this device works, or how this material behaves, etc. So that's what statistics, uh, inferential statistics, is all about. There are two complementary approaches that we've already discussed, creating confidence intervals around your statistics and performing hypothesis testing. There's also a third approach called the Bayesian approach, which is very important, but we're not going to cover that in this series of lectures. We have covered the Bayesian, uh, excuse me, Bayes rule or Bayes theorem, um, but we're not going to use that as an alternate to co confidence intervals or hypothesis testing with regards to a statistic. Here's an example. We measure the mean of a sample and we ask what does this tell us about the mean of the population that we sampled. To answer that we have to know something about the sampling distribution of the mean, which we've already discussed. Uh, what is the sampling distribution of the mean? Well, the mean uh, X bar is uh, the mean of a set of outputs of experiments. Every Xi, the i output of some measurement or some experiment, is a random variable. I sum up those random variables, divide by n. I get another random variable, the mean of the sample. The expectation value of that sample mean equals the population mean. In other words, this is an unbiased estimator. And the variance of that sample mean is the population variance divided by the sample size. So if I want to make my estimator more precise, then I need a larger sample size, make n bigger. This equation assumes an infinite population, this equation for the variance of the sample mean. Um, whenever the we have a finite population and the sample size approaches or exceeds about 10% of the entire population. Then there's a correction that we have to use to this formula. Uh, I won't discuss that, but you can look it up if you ever need it. If the population variance is finite, then the central limit theorem kicks in. And it doesn't take too big of a sample uh, before our statistic, the sample mean, starts having a normal distribution regardless of the distribution of the underlying population. Uh, if, especially if that um, underlying population distribution is uh, reasonably symmetric, then only a few uh, um, samples, 20, 30 uh, sample size, will be enough to allow uh, this central limit theorem to apply and we can create a z-score, z-statistic which is a standard normal distribution. Uh, it does assume we know the population standard deviation though, which we generally don't. So uh, if we substitute the sample standard deviation in this equation, then instead of a normal distribution we get a student's t distribution. The student's t distribution is a little bit different for small sample sizes. 
Once the sample size becomes 20 or 30, certainly by 30, we generally won't notice enough difference between a student's T distribution and a normal distribution to care. But if we have small samples, in particular 10 or less, then we really do have to worry about the student's T distribution and its difference from the normal distribution. And as we've seen before, we can create a confidence interval for the mean. If I have my mean mu, I create a confidence interval, an uh, x bar plus a margin of error and an x bar minus a margin of error, where x bar is my point estimate from this particular sample. Here I show the t alpha over 2 uh, number that would come from a student's t table for particular degrees of freedom and a particular, uh, well that of course comes from the particular sample size, degrees of freedom being n minus 1. If I have a large enough sample, then the t value uh, approaches the z value. And here's an example using a large sample where my t uh, alpha over 2 becomes z alpha over 2. For a 95% confidence interval, that number is 1.96, or about 2. Generally, you don't need much more precision than using the number 2. But uh, if, we, if we pick stick 1.96 in here, then I have the 95% confidence interval, um, assuming that uh, n is bigger than about 30, so that we can use the normal distribution rather than the student's t distribution. What does this confidence interval tell us? It says 95% of any random sample that I might collect is, is likely to capture the true mean with an interval constructed in this way. Uh, we could also do hypothesis testing, and especially for two-tailed hypothesis testing, there's a very uh, easy relationship between confidence interval and the hypothesis test. Does the hypothesized mean fall within the confidence interval? Does the null hypothesis mean fall within the confidence interval? If it does, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. If it doesn't, then uh, uh, we, we could reject the uh, null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis that that the mean is different. All right, that's a review of what we've discussed so far about inferences about the mean. There's another interesting application that comes about frequently that is comparing two sample means. I've got uh, two populations, mu1, sigma1, uh, the, the mean and standard deviation of one population, and mu2, sigma2, the mean and standard deviation of another population. And I want to know if these two populations have different means. For example, uh, I might um, test uh, a drug compared to a placebo and do the populations of outcomes, patient outcomes, differ between those two. Um, I might uh, have two different processes for making a device and I want to know is the yield better for one process versus the other. So I have two samples and I want to compare their means. To do this there's two important sampling approaches that are commonly used, creating independent samples and creating matched samples. So I'll describe what both of those are. Independent samples we've, we've been talking about uh, uh, all through this class, if we have two independent samples, we can use their independence to do calculations of expectation and variance. So I, if I have two samples, uh, they'll have a sample mean and a sample standard deviation. And we want to know, can we infer that the population means are different? That is, can we infer that mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero? Well, let's use as our statistic the difference in the sample means, x1 bar minus x2 bar. First, we'll calculate the expectation of that difference, and we'll find that that expectation is uh, unbiased. That is, it does produce the difference in the population means. So if I let my sample size go to infinity, um, then my answer would be unbiased.
what we really want to know, besides whether the, the mean, the estimator is unbiased, is what is the variance of our estimator. So our estimator of the difference in the means is x bar 1 minus x bar 2, and the variance of that we can now calculate if we assume independent samples. Uh, you recall that the variance of the sum of two independent random variables will be the sum of their variances. So the variance of, of x1 bar is here, the variance of x2 bar is here, and sum their variances because they're independent. If I have large independent samples, then it's a pretty good approximation to, to estimate sigma 1 by the sample standard deviation. And we can estimate the population standard deviation of the second of the second population with the second sample standard deviation. And we can plug them in. Uh, this z-score then becomes about uh, normal standard normal, and we can do our standard confidence interval and hypothesis tests as a result. Occasionally, we can do something a little bit better by pooling our samples. What if I had two populations that had different means, or at least we're trying to determine whether or not they have different means, but they have the same variance. We somehow know ahead of time but the variance between these two populations is the same. What can we do? Well, as before, we sample the two populations and, and do it independently so that the sample means are used to make inferences about the population means. But if we're confident that the population variances are the same between these two populations, we can pool all of the sample data and make one estimate of the population variance. And this is nothing more than a weighted average of the two individual sample variances. I weight them by the number of degrees of freedom in, in my data. Um, if I have exactly the same sample sizes for the two populations, well then this is nothing more than the, the average of the two numbers. But if I happen to have more or less uh, sample size in one sample versus the other, then this is how I would weight them when combining. Now with a, uh, oh and by the way, if I'm going to use this to do t-tests, that is if I have a small sample sizes, the number of degrees of freedom for the t-test will be n1 plus n2 minus 2, that is the total size of the sample minus 2 because I'm calculating two means uh, and that reduces my degrees of freedom by 2. So using the pooled samples, we have this pooled estimate of the variance. The variance of our estimator uh, becomes this. Uh, actually, this should be x1 minus x2 bar, rather than uh, x minus y. But uh, the variance of the difference of the two means of my two samples is simply now my pooled uh, sample standard deviation uh, times the square root of, of 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And again, for t-tests, we will use a degrees of freedom of the total numbers in both samples minus 2. Now, not always is it possible to, or even uh, desirable to use two independent samples. Sometimes it's better to use matched samples. What is a match sample? A match sample is used whenever we want to compare a before and after experiment. So I've got a test piece and I want to know does this annealing process uh, improve the Young's modulus of the sample? Um, uh, does, the, um, does some other treatment reduce the glass transition temperature of a polymer, etc.? What I'll do is I'll take my samples and I, m I measure the property before I do the treatment. Then I'll apply the treatment and measure that same property again after. What I'm looking for is the difference before and after on the exact same test piece. So if I have n test pieces and I measure before on all of them, I do the treatments and I measure after on all of them, it will be better instead of just pooling all the before data and pooling all the after data 
to match the exact sample. So here the subscript I implies that I've used the exact same sam uh, test piece for the before and after measurement. And then I calculate the difference. In this case, X and Y are not independent for the same sample I. They're not, the same, not independent because they're the exact same test piece. Now, instead of doing analysis on X and analysis on Y, and calculating their averages and taking their difference, I will calculate all the differences ahead of time and then find the mean value of the differences. And again, for large samples, the central limit theorem kicks in and uh, this Z statistic will end up being about standard normal. And we can do our, the same kind of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests that we've done before. Now, all of these tests and everything we've talked about in statistics basically assumes that we do a good job of sampling. And there's lots of ways to get the sampling wrong. So let's talk about what is required to do a good job of sampling. Well, first of all, if, if we are comparing two treatments, we have to make sure that we have random samples. That is, uh, if, if I'm doing, uh, for example, comparing a, a, a drug to a placebo, I want to randomly assign patients to one of the two categories of either getting the drug or getting the placebo. Um, in the case of people, you want these, these uh, assignments to be blind, that is, in fact, double blind. You want neither the patient nor the doctor to know who's getting what. Uh, only at the very end when you analyze the data do you reveal who got the treatment and who got the placebo. Um, in general, if you keep your sample sizes equal for the two uh, samples you're trying to compare, that gives you the most powerful test. If you use match samples, we have the added benefit of eliminating the effects of uncontrolled variables. Um, if I have some uh, difference in, in the one piece that I'm testing before and after and a different piece that I'm testing before and after, it could be that the differences between those uh, samples, which is uncontrolled, uh, won't affect the difference, the before and after. And so we can eliminate some of those variation and get a more precise answer. And of course, larger samples always produce more powerful tests. The key is to ensure that the assumption of independence and identical distribution is true and, and we have to uh, uh, carefully control our experiments in order to make sure that that is true. All right, let's review what we learned here in lecture number 13. Uh, as always, you should be able to quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, you should go back and review the material. What assumptions go into the calculations of large sample and small sample confidence intervals for the sample mean? What are the two sampling approaches that we've discussed for comparing two sample means? And finally, when can we use a pooled sample variant? Well, in this lecture, we've talked about inferences about a mean. Next time, we'll do the next most common statistical uh, task for inference, and that is making inferences about a variance. Till then.